Today's sermon title is Submitting to God's Will. And it's finishing off on Paul's testimony. And last week we were discussing the power of testimony. And the power of testimony from the disciples' witness to Paul's witness to the life of Jesus Christ. The testimony and the witness, first-hand accounts of their witness of his death and of his resurrection and how that still today plays out for the power of the gospel to the ends of the earth. This is the reason why we have witness. This is the power of testimony. And it is not only their power of testimony, but for ours as well as we experience Jesus Christ, as we encounter Jesus Christ, and as we experience the power of the resurrection of the gospel ourselves and how that transforms our lives to boldly proclaim this life through Jesus Christ but as you'll see here even in Paul's testimony even through their power of testimony even in the power of Jesus's own witness from even our own not everyone will be readily receiving the testimony and some people might even reject with violence um, and with sorts of anger But we see here, even in Paul's life, God warning, Jesus warning Paul and him talking about how his desire for his people, Lord. And today, it really is about submitting to God's will. And as I was meditating on these verses, we'll get to the verses. It really was about um, my own desire versus God's will. And how sometimes even my own desires, accordingly, even with all of the best intentions, even as a Christian, these desires sometimes will not be God's will. So today's verses are Acts chapter 22, 17 to 21. We'll read the verses, we'll pray, and we'll begin. When I had returned to Jerusalem and I was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, go. For I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And this is the word of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you today for your goodness, your faithfulness, that you are truth, your glory, and your power, Lord. And I ask that you would reveal more of yourself to glory, LA. Lord, that our faith would stand on you and you alone of who you are and of your word. That everything about our lives, Lord, would be founded on who you are, Jesus. So, Lord, I ask for more of you. As Will was praying earlier, God, we want more of you. And I ask for that blessing, Lord. That even at home, that Holy Spirit, you would fill their households with your presence. That you would minister to reveal your glory and all of your character, Lord. That we would know and trust in your goodness, Lord. So we thank you today. We ask that you would bless this day as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it really is when I was looking at these verses and meditating and really seeing Paul's heart for his people. And I saw his desire. Paul's desire was to stay in Jerusalem and to continually minister to his people. God was warning him through a trance saying, you need to leave now. You need to leave quickly because they will not receive your testimony about me. But he refuted God. He said, Lord, they all know. They all know what I did. They all know that I imprisoned and beat all your believers. They all know they saw me stand by and give approval to Stephen's death as he shed his blood for you. They all know. But God says, go, go, and I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And we know about Paul's desire and love for his own people from Romans. And he says this, he says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers Paul loved his people. He would be cut off from Christ as long as they would be saved. But God had another purpose. He had another plan for Paul. 
And in Acts, back in chapter 9, we see when Paul uh, meets Jesus Christ on the road of Damascus. And God speaking to Ananias, the prophet. And he says, but the Lord said to him, go for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles, the kings and the children of Israel. His will at this time was to go to the Gentiles and to minister to the gospel to the Gentiles. Why? Wow. Because the rejection from Israel caused salvation to all nations. That was the purpose from the beginning that God wanted all nations to receive the gospel, not just Israel, not just the Jewish community, but every single nation would receive Jesus Christ. And even in this, not only was God sending him for the purpose to the Gentiles, but God was saving Paul because in this, the Jews were plotting to kill him. And you see that even in this situation, by the help of his friends, Paul escaped death and he escaped the city. He may have been willing to face death in order to save some of his brothers, of his sisters. But God had a specific plan for him. So we see this even in our own desires. And I want you guys to kind of um, understand this as I was kind of meditating. Paul had good intentions. He wanted to minister Jesus Christ. Every city, when you read about Paul, every town he went to, every city he went to, the first thing he always did was go into a temple to minister and to proclaim Jesus Christ and to talk about Jesus Christ and to persuade people that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. But in this case, even with this good intention, it was not God's will for him to stay. It was God's will for him to go And I want us to understand, first of all, desire is not necessarily a bad thing. God places certain desires within us. Some good, and sometimes our flesh, our sin in the world gives us bad desires. We have desires that are good, like marriage, having a family, wanting a good job, providing for our family, um, helping people out. Paul's desire here was to stay on behalf of his people. But again, just because you have good intentions, maybe even Christian intentions in your desires, plans, and purposes, it does not necessarily mean it is God's will. What are some good desires that you have had or have in your life? I want you to start thinking about them. These desires that you have that you want um, to be fulfilled or are pursuing in your life. And I was kind of thinking about the desires, um, good uh, good intended desires of my life in the past. I always wanted to, this is the first thing. The first thing I always wanted to do is be a rich businessman because I wanted to support God uh, in missions with a lot of money. I just, you know, I probably just wanted to be rich. The next thing I remember when I was reflecting on this is I just wanted to be rich. You know, not even a businessman. I just wanted to be rich because I was like, Lord, the rich and the powerful and the famous need someone to minister to them too. So make me rich. A desire to be a missionary. I had a desire to be a worship leader. What's so funny is I never had a desire to be a pastor. But the problem with our desires is that a lot of the times it becomes man-centered and it becomes self-centered. And this is what I mean. It's meaning we think with human-centered ideas and we try to achieve our desires with uh, with our human-centered ideas. Everything that we do is by our flesh and by fleshly strength. We don't think with the wisdom of God. We don't have his wisdom, nor do we know what he is specifically planning and purposing. And we don't know how to achieve these things by how God wants them to be achieved unless he starts revealing. So the perfect example when I was meditating and I came across Peter and Peter's story. And even with revelation from the Father, He was blessed. The Father revealed to him that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus was like, yes, Peter. Yes. And right after that, what happens? Matthew 16, 21, 23, when Jesus was declaring that he needed to suffer and die. 
And so in Matthew 16, 21, 23, it says, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside. He took him aside and began to rebuke Jesus, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. The will of God was for Jesus to die, but Peter had his own plans for Jesus. Peter had his own plans for Jesus' kingdom. Because what would happen to Peter if Jesus died? You know, this was, their, this was what they left their families for. They left their jobs. They left their homes. Peter left their wife, his wife. And if Jesus came to nothing and died... What would come of Peter? And what's so funny that when you see the stories of the disciples and how sad they were with Jesus' death, what's funny is time and time and time and time again, Jesus kept teaching the disciples, hey, I'm going to have to die. I'm going to have to die. I'm going to have to die. But what's funny is every time they, Jesus taught them that, he also said, but on the third day, I'm going to be raised. Each and every time he told them on the third day, I'm going to be raised. I'm going to be raised. I'm going to be raised. But for some reason, I guess they didn't hear that part. And even here, Peter doesn't hear that part. And all he thinks about is just Jesus dying and what would come of his kingdom. What would come of his own life. And how many of us do this exact same thing where we make our own plans for Jesus? We're like, no, 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 Jesus. I think, uh, I think you got it all wrong here. I think I know best about my life and how I want to achieve my desires, maybe even your desires. And I do that all the time, to be honest. We think we know better than God, and we play out our lives in that way, in that manner. And sometimes, maybe most times, and this is, you know, strictly speaking of me, our desires just become straight worldly because we are in the flesh, because we're surrounded by sin. And the world and everything of the world were constantly being bombarded by it. And Israel's desire was to be like all the other nations. And you see this in 1 Samuel, their desire to have a king. And their desire was, hey Samuel, you're old, your sons aren't walking with God, give us a king. Give us a king like all the other nations. And what does Samuel say? Samuel warns them against it. He is telling them this is not a good idea. And he warns them not to have a king. And this is what they say. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no. But there shall be a king over us that we may also be like all the nations. And that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. They essentially did not want God to rule over them. What they wanted was to be like everyone else. And how many fall into that? That our desires is not to be ruled under God, not to be submitted to him, but our desire is to be like everybody else. And we fall into temptations and destruction when we fall into these desires. And one of the mistakes that we make, or I make, in falling into these desires is that we make our Christian lives about myself. I'm the hero of all these biblical stories. I place myself in the center of history. And when we start making everything about ourselves, that's where everything goes wrong. And I understand um, that it's important, you know, I emphasize this. I understand the importance of our purpose, our call, and our role. God gives us these things. He gifts them to us. And it's important for us to fulfill these things, to be placed into a church, to find our role, to fit together so that the church may be started building itself up in love. This is what Paul talks about. But where it gets a little skewed is when the purpose of my life becomes about finding just my purpose, my calling, and everything becomes inward to just me. And it's funny when I think about these things, even all my Christian life, you know, we're fed um, and we analyze and we symbolize these great 
Christian stories and we place everybody as the main character in those stories that you're King David and as King David you're fighting Goliath and you have to overcome certain things in your life and you have to slay Goliath. But David, Moses, Joseph and all these great people in history, biblical history, are a representation and a shadow of the one that is to come, Jesus Christ. You are not King David. You are not Moses, you are not Joseph, you are not Noah, you are not Paul, you are not Peter. You are not these his heroes of history throughout biblical text. And what's funny is I was listening to this sermon and this pastor was saying this. He goes, you want to place yourself in the story of history? You want to place yourself in the story of the Bible? You are Israel. You are the one that is afraid to face Goliath. You are the one shivering in fear. You are the one in need of a savior. You are the one constantly rejecting God. You are the one that wants to be like the world. You are the one that is doomed in destruction. And that's so true. But when I keep placing myself in the middle of history as a biblical hero, everything becomes about me and what I have to do. But when you look at the stories and you analyze what is happening, it is not these men that actually achieve what they achieve. It is God achieving everything. And when you really know these men, you know that every single man that God has ordained and appointed and anointed, they all fail. And it's about God's faithfulness. It's about God's might. It's about God's mercy and grace. It's about God's love and his goodness that really shines through all of these stories. And even in your own story, it should be God's character shining through. We should be focused on discovering his purpose. We should be focused on discovering his will. And when we do that, and when we set ourselves to discover his uh, purpose and will and his plan and how he is moving in history, then we fit into that part of history. And I love this. It's so genius that when Jesus says, whoever loses your life for my sake, you're going to find it. You'll find your purpose. You'll find your calling. You will find who you are. You will find who I created you to be when you lay down your life for my sake. And sometimes we need to trust in that. He has already instructed us how we could find these things. We simply need to listen and trust. But when you think about these things and you have this mind that is fleshly, mind that is um, man-centered and even, you know, self-centered. Um, how do we change this mindset that's so, so uh, about me at times? And I, I came upon, you know, I was just kind of reflecting this. And Romans 8, 7, it says, The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. If your mind is governed by your flesh, it is hostile to him. And it even says, and Paul continues, it says, it does not submit to God's law. It does not, and it cannot submit to God's law. And it says in Romans 12, 2. So first of all, if your mind is governed by a man-centeredness, it's by your flesh, it is hostile towards God, and it can't submit to God. But Romans 12, 2 says this. Do not be conformed to this world, and he gives an answer of how to break free from that. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Number one, don't be like the world. Paul is telling you, church, do not be like the world. Number two, for your mind to be transformed from being hostile to God and not being able to submit to God, you need to renew your mind through what? It is through his word. Because when you look at this and you dissect what the will of God is and what Paul is talking about in the will of God, he is talking about God's revealed will. It is God's will that has been revealed through his teaching, his command, and through his word. That will. 
And so it says, by testing, you may discern. So in the ESV, it says, so that you may approve. But in the Greek, it's by testing, by testing, you may discern, meaning you may find out the worth of something by putting it to use or testing by actual practice. You're finding out the worth of God and the will of God by actually putting it to use. You are now living out his word and finding out that it is worthy. And I love this and I got this from John Piper. He says, what is necessary is that we have a renewed mind that is so shaped and so governed by the revealed will of God in the Bible that we see and assess all relevant factors with the mind of Christ and discern what God is calling us to do. What he is saying is that God's word is so in us, it's renewing our minds and it's so transforming us that the way we respond to situations, the way we live should automatically be a reflection of the word that is living and renewing and transforming us. A lot of the times we want the word, we want you know, so I, I talked to Joanna and Joanna is always asking me for uh, ap application. And I'm always weak in the application part because I have a hard time explaining my spiritual life. But what John Piper here is saying is this. You should know the word and the word should be in you so much that the way you respond to life and every situation that you are bombarded by automatically just responds by the way God is teaching you how to live. It should be in you. You should be transformed and being transformed formed by it and the revealed will there's two wills that you see in scripture one is revealed and one is a hidden a sovereign and the revealed will is God's plain text he plainly tells all men what his will is through his commands this is his will this is what he wants us to do this is how he wants us to live and so when our minds are being transformed through his word, then we start submitting to it. And I kind of want to talk about this. I was thinking about this, and I was kind of reading an article. And, you know, a lot of the times when I was thinking about um, Christian lingo, we always use the word align. Uh, align our, you know, God, align our hearts to yours. Lord, uh, align my thoughts to yours. And we use this word align. But when I think about these things, and when I pray this prayer to align, and we sit and wait for God to align my heart to his, you know what? That's never going to happen. Well, let, let me not say never, but it's going to take a really, 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 really long time. More than trying to align myself to him, we need to submit to it. Whether we like it or not, we need to submit to his will. It is a submission. It is a place of action. And we can submit because God is good and perfect. I want you guys to understand this. Paul here wants to minister to his people. Paul loves, loves loves his nation, where he loves his nation so much that he's willing to be cut from Christ. He's willing to be separated from the one he truly loves the most just so his nation could have him. This Paul is giving up the desire to minister to his people. Why? Because he trusts God. He's able to let go of these things because he knows God will have his people. And he knows that God is good that God loves the Jewish community more than him. And he understands who he is, so he is able to let go. And I want you guys to understand even today, for you guys to let go of certain things in your life and for you to submit, we need to know God. Doesn't he need to be trustworthy? Don't you need to experience his faithfulness, his goodness, that his will for you, his plan and purpose for you is perfect? And Paul knew this. Matthew 5, and this is just a little, a couple of characteristics of who God is. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. 
For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only our brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Do you guys get this? If God, our Father, if Jesus Christ pours out blessing to the evil and the good, to the just and the unjust, how much more of his goodness, how much more of his perfect will towards you and his purpose will be perfect for those that are his children? You can count on it. He's good to those that are evil. Right now is an amazing time of his mercy where his wrath is being held back to the coming of his son. And those that are evil and wicked, those who even reject God, who even curse God, get to have families, live an abundant life, get to have the joys of living, get to have the joys of everything that he created. How much more for his own children? Sometimes we just got to trust in who he is, that he knows best. And I always think about my parents. One of the most, most regretful things that I always, it always haunts me is that I was a bad son and I didn't listen to my parents like I should. And you always know or you always think that you know best, but you don't know fill in the blank. It's one of my most regrets. But if my parents knew better, how much more does God know better? He has all wisdom, infinite knowledge, time is, he knows best. And he created you. He formed you. He would know what your true desire is to fulfill your heart. Sometimes we just got to let go to get the better. Matthew 7, 9, 11. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for a bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask? We have to just simply trust in his goodness, guys. Can we get the praise team up here? You know, when you read things like this, many of us want this kind of experience. The disciples, Paul, all the prophets, all the biblical heroes, we want this experience where God is clearly telling us what to do, where to go, what not to do, where not to go, and to really lead us. But let me tell you something. God doesn't speak that way to everybody. He can and he does, but for most people, he has given us his word to follow. And this has all the instruction we need to live this life. And everything else, God will lead and fill. But I want to tell you guys this, and this is something I always think about. Because this is something I've always pursued. I've always pursued, you know, the supernatural because I've experienced it in missions. But this is what God emphasized in my life, always seeking supernatural, seeking his voice, seeking a sign, seeking guidance, seeking just anything. It is this, and if you're, if you're one of those that are seeking something supernatural, seeking an audible voice, seeking just something from God to come to just send you on your way, you gotta understand this. Great men in all of history, King Saul, almost every great man in the Bible, at one point disobeys God's command, a given command directly from the Lord. You have to understand it. And I want you to understand this. If we are not desiring to seek his word, to know his word, to live by his word, to cherish word, his word, to know his word. And if we have a hard time just simply with this, do you really think 
that if you're not living according to his teachings that is revealed and plain for us to see, do you think when God comes and speaks and commands you that you'll listen? No, you will disobey. And do you think that it will be a graver sin for your disobedience when he comes to you with his voice and you don't listen? A lot of the times God is giving you grace and mercy. You seek for a guidance. You seek for a sign. But what if you get that sign and you don't listen? What would that do? It would harden your heart so much. And a lot of the times, the things that we don't receive from God, you have to understand and know His goodness for you. That He is saving you. That He is building you. And that He wants the best for you. So for us to really clearly see His will, God's not going to speak the way He speaks to us while we go into church and all of a sudden you're just in a trance and God starts speaking to you in a trance. It doesn't, it rarely happens. You know, few people, it might happen. You know, God may pour out this kind of grace and He does, it happens. But for most of us, we're not going to be sitting here while God is audibly speaking and we're in a trance. We have to understand His will from here. And the more we know God and the more we start living this word out, I guarantee you as God guides because the Spirit is with you and the Spirit leads you, you will be so aware, alert, and sensitive to God, how God is speaking, where God is telling you to go, how God is wanting you to minister. But first, we got to know His revealed will that is plain for us to see. And there is His hidden will, His sovereign will, where God is working that we cannot see. But, you know, we want to know these things, you know. What are you doing, God? What are you doing in my life? What's going to happen? His plans and purpose in His hidden will, His sovereign will, is a will that can never be changed. So His revealed will, His will of commands, you could break it. You could disobey but His sovereign will, His will that is hidden, can never be broken. It is always accomplished. Sin and the things God hates cannot deny God's purpose. And you see this throughout all of history. You see Paul's sin even here. God had a mission for Paul before Paul was even born. He was to be an instrument for his name to the Gentiles, to the kings and the children. But yet we see Paul in his earlier life, he was destroying the church, imprisoning, beating Christians, killing Christians, approving of their death, on the road to punish and imprison more. But yet his own sin, his own rebellion, his own disobedience, his own arrogance could not deter the purpose and God's will in his life. That is, I don't know if, if that doesn't encourage you, what will? My sin, my disobedience, my life could not deter God's plan for me. Now I want you guys to understand this. And it's not for you guys to say, oh, then, you know, I guess I could continually sin because God's plan is going to be fulfilled anyways. But how do you know? Again, that's why even for Paul, there was repentance. He had to repent. He had to repent. For my life, I had to repent. I had to respond. And I want you guys to be assured today, if you truly do believe in Jesus Christ and you're struggling with life, be reassured and be encouraged and strengthened that God's purpose in the history of salvation cannot change, nor can anyone deter it from happening. And if you are a part of that, He will finish the race for you. He will make sure that your faith will come into completion. But we have a responsibility to respond through repentance by believing, by loving, by trusting, and by obedience. And He will see us through 
all the way to the end. And I love this and I want to end with this. It's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus himself with his human nature in a spiritual battle understanding the death that he was about to enter and the fear you guys have to understand the fear of him the stress of him sweating blood was not because he was going to die on the cross it wasn't because he was going to suffer a a, a crazy uh, torturous suffering he was stressing because in all of eternity he was about to be separated with his father because he would have to take the wrath upon himself for you. And God cannot stand sin, oh holy God. And he became separated by his Father for the sake of us. But yet in this moment, Jesus asks his Father, Father, take this cup. If you can take this cup from me, take it. But he says, yet not my will, but yours be done. And this is needs to be our life. Not my will, not my desire, not my plan, not my purpose, but yours be done. Because it is for His glory. Let's pray.